Good evening, everybody. My name is Lee Fuman. I'm director of the University of Texas Marine Science Institute. And I welcome you all to our public lecture series that we have every uh, winter time. And I know many of you have been here before. How many are here for the first time? Wow, good group. All right. And uh, many of you know we've been doing this for 11 years. Why don't those of you who've been coming all 11 years show the others how, how much you enjoy this? <laughs> Thank you. We're getting through the season, so we're getting down on the list of uh, talks, and we're losing a little bit of our audience because some of you are heading back up north thinking there's going to be an early spring. <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice to have you all here, and uh, we will keep doing this as long as you guys keep showing up. So thank you for coming. Uh, before I get on with the events of the day, I know you're all going to be rushing out at the end of this uh, to do the things that you do afterwards, and I just want to give you a little plug for next week's talk. Uh, next week's talk is uh, called Exploring Animal Communities in Seagrasses with City, Suburb, and Island Habitat Qualities. This is given by Jeff Henskin, who recently completed his degree here. So he's one of our students, and he's coming back to, uh, to make that talk for you. So I hope you'll enjoy that. Uh, as most of you know, we usually start off the evening by uh, uh, hearing one episode of our radio program, Science in the Sea. For those of you who are new here, Science in the Sea is a program that we've been producing now for five years. In fact, I was just in the studio last weekend recording our end of our fifth year of production. And uh, it airs on now 183 radio stations around the country in about 39 states. So uh, if you're interested in finding out if you can hear it uh, back at your hometown, you can go to our website, scienceinthesea.org, and look on the map and you can see if there's a station nearby you. And if there isn't, and you'd like to have it, just tell your radio station that you want to have it, and let us know, and we send it to them for free. It doesn't cost them a thing. So here's this week's episode of Science in the Sea. Exploring Science in the Sea. Before the days of the Roman Empire, monk seals were just about as plentiful on Mediterranean beaches as tourists are today. Because of the seal's love of sun and sea, the Greeks placed them under the protection of the gods Apollo and Poseidon. Today, the Mediterranean monk seal could use a little of that divine protection. It's one of the most endangered mammals in the world. The seals first fell prey to the Romans, who used their furs to make shoes, tents, and other products, and their fat to make candles. The surviving seals left the beaches and moved into caves and grottoes, usually along the craggy coasts of remote islands. That allowed their populations to rebuild a bit. In the 20th century, though, they faced new threats. Fishermen killed them because they damaged nets and competed for fish. And their habitat was destroyed by development and pollution. They disappeared from the Atlantic and the Black Sea, and their presence in the Mediterranean dwindled to alarming levels. Today, only two major colonies remain. One is in the islands off the coasts of Greece and Turkey. Greece, in fact, has established a marine sanctuary to protect them. The other colony is along the northwestern coast of Africa. But about two-thirds of that colony was wiped out in 1997, although scientists aren't sure why. The few hundred remaining Mediterranean monk seals are listed as critically endangered but scientists aren't sure whether that designation will be enough to keep the seals from disappearing. Science in the Sea, a production of the University of Texas Marine Science Institute, is on the web at scienceinthesea.org. I'm Holly Brawley. I bet you didn't know there was a a seal in the Mediterranean. Okay, so if you did, did you know there used to be one in the West Indies in the Gulf of Mexico? Same kind of seal, a monk seal. Like that one went extinct uh, sometime during the past century <laughs> from hunting and things like that. Pretty interesting. Okay, uh, before we go on to introduce tonight's speaker, I just want to remind you that if you want to uh, be on an email list to receive notification of these seminars, we have a sign-up sheet on the tables on the side. If you want a list of the remaining uh, talks in this series, that's also on the side. And there's some other things for you on the, on the tables on the side. And uh, please help yourself to those. So I want to introduce tonight's speaker. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Donna Shaver. And she provided me a little bio. And I was going to cut bits of it out and just give you the important stuff. But it's all important. Oh. <laughs> Don, 
Actually, Donna and I just realized that we overlapped together uh, during our, our uh, college training. Uh, Donna was, uh, did her uh, bachelor's degree at Cornell University at, for one year overlapping with me while I was working on my master's degree there. It was a very, very nice uh, place to be. Uh, Donna Shaver, Shaver, Shaver is the uh, Chief of uh, Sea Turtle Science and Recovery for the National Park Service at the Padre Island National Seashore. Dr. Shaver has worked with sea turtles for the last 31 years. She oversees a variety of sea turtle research and conservation projects conducted in Texas, is the Texas coordinator of the Sea Turtle Stranding and Salvage Network, collaborates with other researchers in the U.S. and Mexico, and provides training and leadership to hundreds of biologists and volunteers working with sea turtles in Texas and Mexico. She received her B.S. degree in wildlife biology from Cornell University, her master's degree in biology from Texas A&I University, and her Ph.D. in zoology from Texas A&M University. She's delivered more than 110 scientific presentations and authored or co-authored more than 90 publications and reports dealing with sea turtles. She's been interviewed by Dateline, Discovery News, New York Times, Washington Post, Texas County, Country Reporter, and numerous other media outlets. She was featured as ABC World News Tonight's Person of the Week on July 29, 2005. She's done amazing work with the sea turtles here in Texas, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about her work. Would you welcome Dr. Donna Shaver? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I spoke here about three years ago. Anyone here attend that presentation about three years ago? Great, great. Well, thank you for coming back. I have some new information to provide you. So let's see, if we could get the lights, I'm ready to go right into the slides. We have been working to try to help save the Kemp's Release Sea Turtle. Uh, it's been international efforts for many years, and the United States joined into international <coughs> efforts beginning in 1978. And here in Texas, we've been working to try to restore the Kemp's Ridley and increase nesting by this magnificent species on our shorelines. And the Kemp's Ridley is the world's most endangered sea turtle species. Fortunately, the numbers have been rising in recent years, but uh, it's got quite an interesting story to tell. And before I start, I want to mention that the work that I do at Padre Island National Seashore, I couldn't do without the help of amazing staff and volunteers. Uh, we have over 100 volunteers that aid us every year. And the work that I'm going to describe is also cooperative with many partners, including right here, Tony Amos and the ARC and UTMSI, and other partners, federal partners, state partners, non-governmental agencies, and partners down in Mexico. It takes all of us working together to try to get this work accomplished. So going over the biology of the Kemp's Ridley a little bit, again, Kemp's Ridley, the most endangered sea turtle species in the world. Sea turtles spend the majority of their lives in the sea, as the name would imply. The nesting females come ashore, they dig a hole, they lay their eggs within that hole, they cover it, and they return to the sea. They provide no maternal care for those eggs. The eggs hatch for the Kemp's Ridley after anywhere from 45 to 60 days of incubation. And the hatchlings emerge from the nest during either the nighttime or the early morning hours. They crawl down the beach, they enter the sea. The hatchlings are planktonic with the currents for the first about year of life. They settle into lines of debris and seaweed. Some Kemp's Ridley sea turtles are thought to spend their entire life cycle within the Gulf of Mexico. Others are shunted out the Gulf of Mexico, up the Atlantic coast of the United States, and some even cross the Atlantic. There's even been records of a few Kemp's Ridleys from Ireland, the Azores and then they come back to the U.S. waters. The juvenile Kemp's Ridleys, uh, about starting at about 12 inches long and then getting larger, the juveniles 
settle into what are called developmental habitats where these turtles feed and they grow and they migrate seasonally to find warmer waters. You will oftentimes hear about cold stunnings of Kemp's Ridley turtles along the eastern seaboard of the United States, uh, Chesapeake Bay, Long Island Sound, those cold stunning events involving mostly Kemp's Ridleys. Here in Texas, just in February, we had a huge cold stunning event uh, with very, very cold temperatures, the turtles washing ashore, um, unable to control their body temperature because they're reptiles and they had to be rescued. But ours were mostly the green sea turtles. That's the, air, the species most affected here. But these, these juvenile Kemp's Ridleys go between these developmental habitats and then at about 10 to 15 years of age, the Kemp's Ridleys mature. At adulthood, they feed primarily on crabs. Throughout their lifespan, they become more and more crab eaters, going from a more generalized diet to being almost exclusively crab eaters. At adulthood, 10 to 15 years of age, they're about two to two and a half feet long, 80 to 100 pounds, the smallest and the lightest of the sea turtles. I know it sounds big compared to most of the land turtles you may be familiar with, but in the sea turtle world, this is the small sea turtle. Now, most Kemp's Ridleys nest in Mexico in the state of Tamaulipas with the epicenter of nesting near the village of Rancho Nuevo. There was a film that was made by an amateur photographer in 1947 that showed an estimated 40,000 Kemp's Ridley turtles nesting on one day near Rancho Nuevo. And this amazing film was what led to the discovery of the Kemp's Ridley nesting beach. For many years, it was a mystery to scientists. They did not know where this species nested. Didn't even know maybe it was a hybrid because they couldn't find where this was. This famous film was, as I said, taken by an amateur. It was an engineer from Mexico. He put it away in a drawer, and it wasn't found to science until the early 1960s. It was found by Dr. Henry Hildebrand, a very famous scientist from this area. And when that film was found, it was very exciting to the scientific community because finally we knew where Kemp's Ridley's nested, primarily. But what this film also showed it is the large-scale taking of eggs from the nesting beach. And the eggs were gathered in huge quantities and taken off and sold in market as a supposed aphrodisiac. Um, very, very unfortunate. So the large-scale taking of those eggs, as well as the loss of juveniles and adults due to fisheries operations, primarily shrimp trawling, caused the Kemp's Ridley population to plummet. By the time that this film was found and then biologists started going to the nesting beaches in the mid-1960s down to Rancho Nuevo, they found that the population had plummeted. And these large nesting aggregations, like what you see here, this is called an arabada. It's a word in Spanish that means mass arrival. These arabadas had uh, decreased tremendously in the number of turtles that were participating. So the Kemp's really population had plummeted. By the time biologists got there, the Mexican government began to protect the nesting turtles and the eggs down at Rancho Nuevo. Uh, they took this very seriously and put a lot of effort into protecting these turtles and the eggs. But the population continued to decline, and it reached a low of only 702 nests worldwide for the entire year in 1985 down from an estimated 40,000 in one day. So it's a huge, huge decline. So going back in time uh, from that, that very low point in 1985, as the population was plummeting, it was feared that Kemp's really was going to go extinct within a few years unless immediate steps were taken. So the United States joined in to the ongoing protection program in Mexico. And there was a new effort that was started and this involved trying to reestablish nesting by Kemp's Ridley sea turtles at Padre Island National Seashore, which is shown here outlined in yellow. And it was hoped that we could develop a secondary nesting colony of Kemp's Ridley sea turtles here in the United States as a safeguard against extinction 
So this, if some sort of a political or an environmental catastrophe was to occur in Mexico, there would be a safe area right here in the United States where Kemp's release could nest and they could be protected. Now, Padron National Seashore was selected as the location for this project because Kemp's really was a native nester. The National Park Service does not introduce non-native species to their areas. In fact, the first documented record in the literature was a Kemp's Ridley nest that was found at Padron National Seashore before it became a national seashore in 1948. And that record was published in the early 1950s before that film was found. So this was the first published record of Kemp's Ridley's nesting anywhere. And it was right here, Padron National Seashore, and then there were other historic records of the Kemp's Ridley nesting there. The National Seashore was also selected for this project because we're a unit of the National Park System, so we could protect the nesting beach, we could protect the nesting turtles there and the eggs. And we preserved the longest stretch of undeveloped Barrier Island Beach in the United States. It's about 72 miles long, about 67 miles of beachfront. So this was an ambitious program, and it was a measure of desperation to some extent. It was feared that Kemp's Ridley was going to go extinct unless some dramatic actions were taken to try to reverse this trend. So we tried to increase nesting and form the secondary nesting colony. And our project was based around the imprinting hypothesis. It's thought that sea turtles imprint to their natal beach much the way that salmon imprint to their natal stream. It did, biologists did not know whether this indeed actually occurred, we know that there are, is definitely return to a nesting beach um, from the structure of what you see over time. But we didn't know what the mechanism was for this return, and we didn't know how to induce that with certainty. So what we tried to do was to imprint the turtles, hopefully imprint them by exposing the eggs to Padre Island sand and exposing the hatchlings to Padre Island sand and surf. So between 1978 and 1988, we received 22,507 Kemp's Ridley eggs that were packed in sand from uh, Padre Island. The eggs were actually collected from the turtle as she was laying them. Biologists came up behind the turtle, collected the eggs in plastic bags so they never touched the Rancho Nuevo sand. We sent eggs, uh, we sent sand from Padre Island National Seashore down to Mexico. The eggs were packed in the Padre sand, then shipped to Padre Island National Seashore, and the hatchlings were released on the beach at the National Seashore, allowed to crawl down the surf, uh, down the beach and enter the surf, and then they were captured using aquarium dip nets. Uh, easier said than done. We did have a few that slipped by our, our uh, capturing crew, about uh, 200 during the years. Then the hatchlings were sent to the National Marine Fishery Service Lab in Galveston, Texas, for rearing in captivity for about nine to 11 months and that time in captivity was called Head Starting. It was about the same time that the program for the kids was being formed, <laughs> and it was somewhat the same philosophy. Let's give them a boost in life. Let's hold them until they're large enough so that when they're released, they can avoid most predators, and also so that they could be tagged for future recognition. And we were learning a lot as time went on. We were learning how to get better hatching success. We were learning that the turtles had to be separated or otherwise uh, they had to be separated in the holding tanks, otherwise they would nip each other and that was not good. And we were learning how to tag the turtles. When the project started, there was no known permanent way to tag the turtles. But beginning in the 1983 year class, each turtle received this light spot. It's called a living tag, and what that was was like a skin graft where there was a piece of the bottom shell taken out, a piece of the top shell taken out, and the piece from the bottom was glued into the surrounding shell surface on the top. And it provided a permanent light identification marker on the darker background of the shell. And the location of that living tag was varied to these different plates called scutes on the carapace to designate the different year classes, the different years in which the turtles were hatched. Then after the nine to 11 months in Galveston, the turtles were brought back to most of them, and there were variations throughout time, but most of them were brought to South Texas and then were released offshore from North Padre and Mustang Islands. And over time, there were about 13,000 uh, 
of those Padre, what I've called Padre Island imprinted Head Started Turtles were released as yearlings uh, from 1979 to 1989. But there's another group of turtles that I need to talk to you about, and that's what we term the Mexico imprinted Head Starts. After our work was done at Padre Island National Seashore with getting eggs from Mexico and uh, exposing them to the Padre Island sand and surf, there was another group of turtles that was head started. And these were obtained directly from Mexico as hatchlings. And then they were, uh, they'd gone through the process down in Mexico of hatching on the beach at Rancho Nuevo, crawling into the surf, being captured, and actually my assistant Cynthia Rubio was down here in Rancho Nuevo and helped for several years with this process where the Mexico imprinted uh, head starts. So they were captured in the surf, and then they were sent to Galveston, where again reared in captivity, and then tagged for future recognition and released. But the thought was, and the goal was, for these turtles to return to Mexico to nest, to try to help supplement the population that was nesting in Mexico as a part of compensation for taking these eggs from Mexico and trying to have this nesting colony formed at Padre Island National Seashore. Well, in a minute, I'll tell you that the turtles had a different plan in mind than to go back to Mexico. So I started working at Padre Island National Seashore in 1980. I was a young student from Cornell in between my junior year and senior years of undergraduate school. And I fell in love with the project and in love with South Texas. And I was hooked working with the world's most endangered sea turtle species. It was hard to think about going to work with another species. So here I decided that's what I wanted to devote my career to. And people said, oh, you're crazy. You'll never be able to make a career out of that. And here I am all these years later. But what we didn't know back then was at what age does Kemp's really turtle mature? It was thought, well, maybe six to eight years of age. We didn't know. So Beginning in 1986, I started the program of patrols out at Padre Island National Seashore. And we didn't have any resources to speak of. We'd borrow old military surplus vehicles. We had the military come out and take us in a Humvee down the beach. And they viewed it as a military mission that we had to get to the Mansfield Channel and we had to get back. And uh, it was just borrowing whatever we could do to get this program started. And it wasn't until 1996 that we found our first confirmed returnee from this project. So it was 10 years of patrolling until we found our first turtle that we knew came back from this effort. And for many years, I felt like Linus in the pumpkin patch saying, have faith, they will come. And, and we're having a lot of turtles come, not just turtles from this project, but other wild Kemp's Ridley turtles. So the hard work has paid off. And it's expanded well beyond the boundaries of Padre Island National Seashore. So today, we have patrols on all Texas Gulf beaches to some extent, whether it be um, repeated daily patrols, repeatedly during the day, to intermittent every few days. But they're done on all Texas Gulf beaches from April through mid-July, which is the Kemp's really nesting season. And we use various types of vehicles. This is called a UTV a utility transport vehicle, and it looks kind of like a super-sized golf cart. You see a lot of these golf carts around in this area. Um, this one's just a little more heavy duty. And there's also walking patrols. So this is one way that we find these nests in Texas, both the wild turtles as well as the head starts. But there's another way that we find nests, and that's due to reports from the public. And uh, we get many of these each year, and it's a great source of information for us. It's really important. So we spend a tremendous amount of time trying to educate the public about what we're doing and how they can help with our efforts. And we really appreciate that assistance. So what we want, aim to do is we want to find the nesting turtles so that we can document them, we can track their nesting history throughout time, find out results of our experimental and printing work, find out different biological parameters like what's the remigration interval. That means how many years does it take for them to come back. And for Kemp's Ridley, it's on average every two years they come back to nest. And we find what's called the internesting interval. How many days is it between nests? They nest repeatedly during the season. They'll come up 
uh, between one and four times. It's an average of two and a half to three times that they come up during a season for Kemp's Ridley. So we're finding out a lot of interesting information by seeing the nesting turtles and doing what they call a saturation tagging program, meaning that every nesting turtle that we see has to have a tag. If it doesn't have one, when we find it, we apply a tag to it, including what's called a pit tag, and that's what she's scanning for here, and that's the little glass encapsulated tag that's used a lot for the pets now. And also, we want to find these nesting turtles because it makes it a lot easier to find out where the nest is. Finding the nest can sometimes be very tricky. And uh, finding this nesting turtle also is very important because we want to be able to protect her from various threats that occur on the beach because this turtle can lay many clutches of eggs over the course of her lifetime. She is very important to the population, having gone through all those stages where mortality can occur and become an adult. And we're also looking for, and this is our primary visually, visual cue for our patrollers, they're actually patrolling the beaches and they're looking for these tracks left in the sand by the nesting female. Very difficult to do. These, this is tricky work. Uh, we want to find these, these tracks because we want to be able to find the nests and protect those nests from a variety of human-related and natural factors that can impact upon that hatching success. It's thought that under natural conditions, only one in a hundred to one in a thousand eggs will produce an individual that survives to adulthood. We want to find those nests so we can protect every egg and try to boost those odds. So once we find those tracks, we look very hard for where those nests are located because we want to protect every nest. So we dig by hand, we probe, and this can take sometimes hours, four or five hours at one site trying to find that nest because each nest is so important to us and we know left unprotected on the beach, they suffer mortality. We find the eggs, we protect them. But if we don't have success, Finding them through our human means, we sometimes bring in Ridley Ranger. <laughs> and that's my trained dog. That's actually his, fa that's his, that's his, his name, and that's his Facebook page name. So you can say, oh, those are you Facebook fans? <laughs> Go look for Ridley Ranger and become his friend. He needs some more friends. He doesn't have many yet. But this, we just started his page just not too long ago. But it's actually uh, become quite a useful tool for us to have him out there. He's found some nests that we tried, and we tried to find, and he locates them for us. We protect the eggs and uh, have safe incubation for them. And actually, that little guy last year got more publicity than I did. <laughs> he was in Bark Magazine, Family Dog, and Dog Fancy, and the front page of the Caller Times. So, little celebrity. And I'm trying to make sure it doesn't go to his head. So we, wa we want to find those nests so we can protect them. And the way that nests are protected on the Texas coast, uh, most of the eggs that are found on North Padre Island and northward on the Texas coast are brought into our incubation facility at our turtle laboratory at Padre Island National Seashore. And the there's a glimpse inside. It's not open to the public, so there's a glimpse inside of what it looks like with our incubation boxes and the grates on top, et cetera. And as just a quick aside, uh, some of you may have heard about during the uh, Deepwater Horizon oil spill, there was some translocation of loggerhead eggs to try to protect them. And they contacted me for procedures on how to translocate eggs, what kind of boxes, um, what kind of materials you use, and we provided information on the techniques to try to help out with that. And, and if you see pictures, you'll see it looks a lot similar to this because they took our advice and, and used these kind of techniques to try to help out there. Uh, but there are some eggs from the southern part of Padre Isle National Seashore that we're placing in a large screen enclosure called a corral. This is the same technique that's used down in Rancho Nuevo, but on a much bigger scale. Their corrals now are the size of football fields. This is another way to protect eggs. And then there's a corral on South Padre Island that's used to protect the eggs from South Padre Island and Boca Chica Beach. These means of incubation provide very good hatching success in the neighborhood of 80 to 90% hatching success. And also it enables us to be able to guard the turtles while they're released. 
In contrast, those nests that are unprotected on the beach must face uh, different threats from predators, high tides, and, and uh, beach driving. And we know that there have been some nests that despite all of our efforts have gone undetected on the Texas coast. Either these are at sites that are totally unbeknownst to biologists, or they're at sites where we found the tracks and despite all of our activities, and many of these are down island at the National Seashore or other areas, but despite all our efforts, we're unable to find the nest. We mark the site and come back during incubation and look for whether the nest has been predated or whether it hatched. And uh, most of these have sad tales to, to, uh, to tell about what the results are. They're not good in many cases because of those threats. And also there's no means of protecting the hatchlings that emerge from these nests because we don't know exactly where they are. So the, ha the hatchlings are on their own for getting into the water and facing all the threats that, that they've got to go through with the, the gulls and the ghost crabs, et cetera. There's a shot of some of the hatchlings. They're about the size of a silver dollar, and uh, they respond to light, and they, when they're going down the beach, they go towards the brightest area. We invite the public to attend between 20 and 25 of our hatchling releases that are held at Padre Island National Seashore each year. These are very popular with the public, and in 2010, we had nearly 5,000 people that attended our releases at the National Seashore. And we're very, very happy about that because we want people to get to see what we're doing with these turtles, get a glimpse of these tiny turtles taking their first steps in life and going out on this, this adventure and, and um, that's gonna last the rest of their life. And we give an educational program there. And we get people that come in from all over the state all over the country and even people from overseas that come and plan their vacations just so that they can get to see these hatching releases. And it's really exciting to get to talk to the public um, when they come to the release. How many here have seen one of our hatching releases? I know there's at least a few of you out there. There we go, there's a few of you. So if you ever get the chance to come back when it's warmer, and it does get quite warm here during the summer, but uh, this is a great activity for you to come to, and it's free of charge, open to the public. So how do we advertise these releases? Uh, and our new thing, Facebook, we've got a Facebook page. Here's our Facebook page for the Padre Island National Seashore, Division of Sea Turtle Science and Recovery. That's one way we're going to advertise them. Another is our website, and we've got some materials over here, a bumper stickers that have our hatching hotline number and our website address. And what we do is when we get nests that come into our facility, we get on the website and we list the projected release dates. And those are a window. It's kind of like a due date for an expectant mother. You, you know, you think it's going to be in here, but you know, it could be on this end and it could be on this end. So it's about a five day window. And what we tell people from out of town is come at a time when there's several uh, clutches that are due to be released, and the clutch is the number of eggs that are laid, is laid by the turtle at the same time. When there's several of these nests or clutches, they're due to be released at the same time, and that provides insurance, because this isn't show and tell. This is all based on turtles' biology, so these turtles have to be released when they enter a very active state called a frenzy. They all of a sudden start to scurry, and they want to go. They want to go towards the ocean. And we don't allow them to be scurrying in these incubation boxes, just wasting their energy so that we can bring them out 10 hours later and put them on the beach for people to see. When they get in the frenzy, they got to go. It may be 2 o'clock in the morning. Been there, done that. Release them 2 o'clock in the morning. There's several of you out there that have helped with that. Thank you. We've got a lot more to do in the future of that. But there are some that will hold off and not go into the frenzy until the early morning hours and it works well for the releases. And I've gotten over the years pretty good at predicting when these releases are gonna occur. We didn't have to cancel a one of them last year. Uh, the turtles all behaved with my predictions. So we go, which is a nice thing, yeah, because a lot of people look forward to this. We even hear stories of people getting up in the middle of the night. We had some folks that drove in from Oklahoma. And uh, it's just really, it's heartwarming to see so we have the projected release window on the website, and then we tell people, as the date that you're interested in starts, and we say, make sure you come and stay a day or two. Don't just bank on one day. 
uh, give, give a little leeway for the biology there. And then as your date that you're interested in gets close, call our hatchling hotline and we'll narrow down and announce exactly when that release is going to be held. So I want to talk a little bit about what we found. And this is one of our returnees from the experimental imprinting and head starting. And there she is with a living tag. Very exciting to get to see one of these turtles. And whenever possible, we want to examine these turtles for their tags so we can determine results of that experimental imprinting and head starting project. Because not only is this important to our area, but this could be important to others that are trying to increase nesting with different species in different areas. And uh, we've actually had, there's a project that's going on with leatherback turtles uh, that are using some of this methodology. So it's, it's very gratifying to see that our work is not only helping with the species, helping locally, but also helping globally. So we're getting information from these turtles. Again, the first confirmed returnee that we found from experimental imprinting and head starting was in 1996 at Padre National Seashore. Now, most Kemp's release nest in Mexico, as I said, but as far as Kemp's really nesting in the United States, here's the number of nests uh, found between 1989 and 2010. The vast majority of nests found in the US have been right here in Texas, and it's been in South Texas. From uh, most of them from North Padre Island down to South Padre Island and Boca Chica Beach. The documented historic nesting range for Kemp's Ridley is right from here, from Mustang Island southward, down into Mexico, all the way into Veracruz, Mexico. But beginning in 2002, we started seeing nests found on the upper Texas coast. And also uh, in the late 80s, we started seeing these nests. These are all outside of the documented historic nesting range. But beginning in 2002, we started seeing nests in these other areas. And that's the same time that we've started finding those Mexico imprinted head starts. Those turtles that were supposed to go to Mexico to nest, where indeed most of the records have been in Texas. There's been a few records in Mexico, but most of the records in Texas. So here's a graph showing the number of Kemp's early nests confirmed on the Texas coast since 1985. Here's when I started the patrols and we didn't have much. It was tough. But we didn't have many resources to our availability either and our patrols were very scanty. So I'm sure that we missed some nests along that time and we probably still miss some nests as evidenced by what we call these in situ nests, these nests found in place without hatching. But uh, beginning in the 1990s, mid 1990s, we started seeing an increase in nesting. And we had six consecutive years of increases, peaking in uh, 2009 with a record 197 Kemp's Relief Nests found on the Texas coast. And of those 197 found in 2009, there were 117 that were found at Padre Island National Seashore. And I want to make a comparison because I think it's really exciting that that 117 is 16.5% of the 702 that the worldwide population got down to in 1985. So look at how the population has increased. Now in Mexico, uh, last year they were up to about 13,000 nests, down from 702 up to about 13,000. So we're really hopeful that we can climb in that same kind of path in that same kind of direction. And uh, we're very excited about the way that the numbers, the trend in the numbers. But who is coming back to nest? Who, are, who is what we're seeing here? Again, we've got a saturation tagging program. We're trying to see every nesting turtle that we can. Unfortunately, we only get to see the nesting turtle about half the time. In the blue bars here, those are the nests at which we didn't see the nesting turtle. That nesting turtle got in and out before our biologists arrived. And it only takes about 45 minutes for these turtles to nest. It's very, very quick. So about half the time, we don't know who the nester was. But we see that there were some Padre Island imprinted head starts. Their nests are in the red. And some Mexico imprinted head starts, again, starting in 2002. Those are the green bar. 
altogether about 100 nests. And I'm working on a paper that took me about three months to write between everything else I've done and hopefully a year from now we'll see it in press and it goes over in great detail all the results up to date for this. But uh, it, it, results are exciting, but they're still coming in. We're still learning about what the results are from this and we will be for several years to come. But what we see is the largest grouping are the yellow. It's the wild stock turtles. That's the majority of who we are finding nesting on the Texas coast. We're very thankful and, uh, that we've had these returns of these head started turtles, but how exciting, even more exciting, that we've got these wild stock turtles coming. So we say, come on, we welcome you all, all you Kemp's Ridleys. So uh, it's good for the future to not just be dealing with these head start nests, because if we were, our numbers would still be quite petite. So our numbers went down some in 2010. We went down to 141 on the Texas coast after six consecutive record years. The numbers were also down in Mexico. But Kemp's really tend to nest every other year. We had quite a cold winter in 2010, so uh, the thought is that that is probably what impacted upon our nesting levels. And if this is right, knock on wood, 2011 ought to be a banner year. And so we're really, really hoping for that. And uh, maybe I'll come back and speak next year and give you an update of great news. But if not, uh, two or three years from now, they'll invite me back and we'll have even more news to tell you. But I'm hoping overall we're going to see this continued increasing trend. And when they look at the data down in Mexico, what they're finding is a significant and strong increase in nesting and they feel quite strongly that that, that is the trend that, that um, is being seen from the data. And so I'm oftentimes asked, well, so you're finding more nests on the Texas coast. It's probably just because there's more people out there looking. So what we've done to address that is we've standardized the number of nests per unit patrol effort. In the red here is the number of Kemp's really nests found per 50,000 kilometers of patrol effort. That's a lot of effort. There's a lot of people working really, really hard on the Texas coast to find and protect these nests, uh, so many. And we fit a variety of lines, straight line, curvilinear functions to the data, and the best fit is this yellow line. It's an exponential curve with a good fit. So we want to see more years of data, but you know scientists always do, but right now what it's looking like is that Yes, we have an increase in nesting that's going on, and not only is it an increase, but it's an exponential increase. So what I'm telling people is let's be ready, let's be proactive, and that's the kind of work that we're doing at the National Seashore, is trying to plan for these larger and larger numbers. And hence why we started that corral far down island, is because we have a configuration that's so difficult to deal with logistically. We've got 60 miles of beachfront, with no road behind the dunes. So what goes down comes back the same way on the beach. So there will become a time, we think, when there's gonna be thousands of eggs down the island and it's gonna become logistically very difficult for us to move all those eggs up. So we want to perfect this technique of corral incubation on a small scale before our numbers become so overwhelming that we've gotta really you know, work out the kinks uh, when we've got a lot of nests to deal with down there. And We've worked out the kinks very, very well. Cynthia's been running the corrals. My assistant, Cynthia Rubio, uh, my right hand that I just couldn't get things done without. And she's gotten great success down there in the 90, 91% hatching success annually at our corral. So, very encouraging for the future. So since I'm at a university, I have to talk a little bit about our research, not just conservation. We do a lot of data collection in conjunction with this work. And this is important to us because we want to learn the results of our efforts and also gather information to try to increase our understanding of the biology of the species to try to improve our management. The work that I do as a biologist for the National Park Service, I'm not allowed to do this this kind of research that would be to like, find out the function of this particular gland and um, that kind of work. I have to do work that's gathering data that can be useful for management, trying to help make more of these turtles and protect them in the marine environment and protect them from threats 
we still have a lot of human-related threats that we're trying to protect these turtles from. So we're gathering data, uh, and some of it's just really, really exciting to us. With the experimental imprinting and head starting, with our returns from this project, again, this was a hope and a dream that this project was going to work. And what we had was the first sea turtle experimentally imprinting to an area that was confirmed to have returned there to nest. We didn't know whether that imprinting would work. That's with our Padre Island imprinted head starts, that finding right there. And with our Padre Island imprinted head starts, we had the first headed, head started sea turtle of any species confirmed to have nested in the wild. Exciting there too. A lot of people said, oh, those head started turtles are going to be misfits. They're bucket babies. They won't know how to survive in the wild. So I've spent a lot of time comparing various characteristics of wild and head started turtles. Fecundity, number of nests, number of eggs in the nest, how much hatching success, what are the movements of the wild and head started turtles, they're matching up very well. Uh, we're looking at nesters, the size of the turtles that are nesting, the number of individuals nesting. We're trying to get at this through our tag returns as well as gathering uh, tissue from the, the nesting turtles and tissue from the dead hatchlings and the unhatched eggs and doing kinship analysis, trying to match those nests of unknown maternity. Again, that's about half of our nests where we don't see the mother turtle. Match those nests of unknown maternity to our known nesters. So that's exciting work. Uh, we're getting ready to get some of that, those publications out. Uh, looking at the number of nests per individual, the remigration interval that we've talked about, internesting interval, and nest site fidelity. Some had said, some of the naysayers, well, you know, those turtles, they're just going from Mexico up to Louisiana to feed, and they're just going to drop a nest in Texas, and they don't really, you know, they're not really forming a nesting colony there. So we're addressing that through the data, and we're finding, indeed, for many of these turtles, there's excellent nest site fidelity, meaning they come back not only to the same nesting beach within a nesting season and over different years, but some even within a mile or two of where they nested previously. And that's just astounding to me, to go out in the ocean for two or three years to swim around, maybe go to Louisiana, Florida, and come back within a mile. Amazing feat. Uh, now, looking at the number of nests uh, by location and date, very important because of uh, how much effort you're going to put forth to look for nesting and different protection efforts for different areas. Clutch size, uh, looking at the number of nests, so uh, the number of eggs that the, the turtles are laying over time, is that an indicator of a, a population with a smaller clutch size, a younger and younger population that you're seeing? Nest productivity, embryo mortality, looking at the embryological development of the unhatched eggs, trying to determine if there's any of our procedures that might be adversely impacting upon the embryonic development or the survival of those eggs. Looking at sex ratios, this is very important because the incubation temperature during the middle third of incubation determines the sex of the turtles. And so that is within our control. And uh, you can alter the sex ratio by where you put the nests on the beach. Higher on the beach is warmer. Also within our incubation facility, our facility now is climate controlled. We can put basically whatever temperature we want in there. So we aim to produce a predominance of females, which is similar to the sex ratio that's been found in the marine environment doing some netting surveys. And looking at incubation temperatures, because that is very important, again, because that determines the sex as well as the survival. If the temperatures get too hot or too cold or fluctuate too much, it can be lethal to the developing embryos. So we monitor that very closely. We modify that. I've got some of my folks here that have helped me with the incubation facility. And let me tell you, that's a lot of work, but we get good results. Uh, done some studies with nest protection risk assessment. This was done at the National Seashore, a three-year study, trying to look into the future. How are we going to protect these nests in the future when we get uh, many of them? Is it safe to leave them in situ on the beach? And we studied this without risking any eggs. I don't have time to go into the details, but what we find is, found is no, it's not safe. Our delineators that we put on the beach uh, that indicated that there was a nest, that a nest was there. There really wasn't one, but it was signed as if there was. People stole our delineators. People drove over them. People put trash on them. 
we're not there where we can leave nests in place on the beach. Just from the human standpoint, much less the predation and the high tides. Many of those nest sites, we found tidal inundation over it. So our nest protection risk assessment uh, and all this work has to be done very carefully because the most endangered sea turtle species is very high profile. Lots of people watching what we're doing and, what, and we have to make every effort to protect these turtles. So it leads into what we discussed, that next phase that we're going to go to is the corral incubation to supplement our incubation facility. And then a lot of work with satellite tracking. I've done co collaborative studies with partners down in Mexico where we put transmitters on adult males that were captured off the nesting beach in Mexico and the composite of 26 adult males that we tracked, uh, the composite of all their movements is here in blue. And what we found for most of them is that most of them remained resident off the nesting beach in Mexico year round. And for the females, uh, I've tracked them since 1997 and also Texas A&M has started to put on some transmitters for some turtles on the upper Texas coast since 2005. And the composite of all of those transmitters deployed, and it's close to uh, 70 now that have been deployed over time. And what we found in contrast that after the nesting season was done, most of those nesting females left the nesting beach. Some entered waters off of Mexico and um, spent time there for a while, but uh, most of them ended up going to waters off of Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, or the west coast of Florida after they were done nesting. And this is the sort of information that's very important for our protection efforts and worrying about threats to the turtles in the marine environment. And uh, the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department used the satellite tracking data that I collected during the very early stages of this project. One of the objectives was gather data in case somebody wanted to institute either National Marine Fisheries Service or the state of Texas that wanted to institute some measures to protect these turtles in the marine environment. And we had a big problem of mortality of adult Kemp's release off of South Texas uh, and they used our satellite tracking data, nesting data, and stranding data, and established a closed area off the South Texas coast during the entire Kemp's Ridley nesting and mating season out to five nautical miles. And that started in 2001, and I believe that's been very important in helping us achieve that increase that we've seen in the nest numbers over time. So it's really, really gratifying when, as a scientist, your data are used to help to protect the animal that you're studying. That's, that's about as good as it gets. And uh, we'll be deploying more transmitters this year, and you can get on seaturtle.org, and there's uh, a tracking link there, and we'll be putting out transmitters beginning in April. So you can follow those turtles then. So thanks to the hard work of many people, Kemp's Ridley nesting is increasing exponentially in Texas and in Mexico. North Pod Round is the most important Kemp's Ridley nesting beach in the United States. I didn't mention it back there, but uh, we get about 60% of the Kemp's Ridley nests found in the United States are located at Pod Round National Seashore, which makes it the most important Kemp's Ridley nesting beach in the U.S. The Kemp's Ridley restoration efforts in South Texas have received widespread publicity and community support for many years. And I can't thank enough everybody from the community that have helped with educating the public, and the volunteers that have come out and helped us, 100 every year helping, it's, it's wonderful. But we've got to keep the pedal to the metal, the, what is it, the pedal to the metal? Anyway, keep moving to protect because we're going in the right direction. We've got to continue to locate our nesters, our eggs and hatchlings to protect them so they're not killed or harmed or poached on the beach where people could actually take the turtles or the nests if we don't get to them first or harassed while they're trying to nest. We need to continue our education of the public about nesting to inform them to watch for and report nesting activity and how to avoid potentially harmful interactions with the nesting turtles and the eggs. And we want to encourage them to watch for nesting and those of you that will be here during the nesting season, and I know some of you are, if you do see nesting reported immediately to a passing turtle patroller or by calling our uh, hotline number 1-866-TURTLE-5. This is a different number than our hatchling hotline. This is a reporting number. 
So just a few quick tips for those of you that are going to be here during the nesting season on what to look out for and how you can help us if you see nesting turtles. And for those of you who are not, you can see what we're going to be doing. And what we're looking for are uh, the nesting temps release and the tracks they lay, that they uh, make in the sand, the nesting females. But finding these nesting turtles and their tracks is extremely difficult because these uh, the tracks disappear very quickly because the Kemp's really is the smallest and the lightest of the species and they nest mostly during the day when there's less dew the, the tracks can disappear more quickly than they would at night when the dew is uh, greater and often they nest simultaneously in those emergencies those arabatas so you can have days where there's nothing going on you're driving up the beach and there's nothing and then you have days where they're everywhere and they're all there at the same time and you've got to go from nest to nest to nest very quickly. So that makes quite a challenge. And they tend to nest during windy conditions and that contributes to the tracks blowing away very quickly. So I tell the people that are patrolling, if you like a challenge, we've got a job for you because this is challenging. Nesters are difficult to see because their coloration blends with the sand and the vegetation and they often become partially covered with sand during nesting. This is a nesting Kemp's really turtle. You can barely see her. Each nest that is found is a victory. Each nest that is found, there was a hard fought battle for us to find that nest. It really takes a lot of work and a lot of effort, but it's, it's worth it. But I just want to show you those challenges. Uh, imagine trying to see that. And they're nearly motionless for those 15 minutes when they're actually laying the eggs. Okay, where's the turtle? <laughs> right there. Very hard to see the turtle, especially given that she's motionless for about 15 minutes on sand. So our patrollers are looking for the tracks. But even that, imagine, at the National Seashore, we don't grade our beaches. a teeny section in front of the campground. There's more than 60 miles where we don't get rid of this seaweed or the debris. And so it's uh, very challenging to try to find those tracks. While crawling on the beach and nesting, these Kemp's really turtles cannot move quickly to avoid approaching vehicles. This is an ancient animal. It's thought that Kemp's really has been a distinct species for four million years. Adapting to vehicles is definitely not something that, that is in their makeup. They move very slowly. And they sometimes nest in the beach vehicular roadway in the soft sand of the tire ruts. Here's one of these nesting turtles in a trance-like state. When they're actually laying the eggs, they enter a trance-like state where they're oblivious to everything going on around them. That's why the biologists in Mexico were able to go behind those turtles and catch those eggs in the plastic bags without the turtles leaving or stopping or, or anything. So here she is in her trance, oblivious to what's going on. A vehicle, unbeknownst coming, go right over. She will not move for an approaching vehicle at that time. So we encourage people, if they're driving on the beach, to please slow down because these turtles don't have the ability to scoot out of the way. And so please spread the word to those people that you know that drive on the beach during the nesting season to please slow down and to watch carefully. It really, really can help us out. And I want to explain a little bit about where they nest. They can nest anywhere from the high tide line all the way into the dunes. What the turtle does is she crawls up. She digs a hole with her rear flippers. She lays the eggs in the sand. She covers the nest. She uses her front flippers and her rear flippers to cover the nest. And then she vigorously rocks back and forth, tamping down the sand. And it's quite a sight to see. If you're standing there, you can actually feel her thumping the sand. You can feel the vibrations in your feet just coming up from all the, the hard work she's doing to cover that nest. And I've even had visitors report to me, oh, I saw a turtle dancing. And when I hear, I saw a turtle dancing, I said, oh, there's a nest. Because you wouldn't say that unless you saw this behavior. And I guess it's like dancing. They could say that. So uh, we watch for that. And it's important, those of you that are going to be out on the beach, that you don't rush up to the turtle before she's actually found a nest site 
and started laying those eggs in the cavity. She's nearly motionless. She's just lifting her head, oh, so slowly, taking a breath, and the head comes down, and she's nearly motionless. She's laying those eggs. That's the time that we safely come up and we mark the nest. If you approach her before that time, you can frighten her and cause her to go back into the water, and that's called a false crawl. And We don't want that to happen because who knows where she would nest next time, and we wouldn't be able to protect her necessarily. So after she's in this trance-like state and she's starting to lay eggs, then we instruct people to mark the nest. Place something next to the nest, uh, but don't puncture anything into the nest cavity because you could break the eggs. So mark the nest and please protect the turtle and the nest from passing traffic. This increase in nesting on the Texas coast is relatively recent, and there's still some people that don't realize that we've got a lot of Kemp's Rothies that are nesting here. So we've got people driving up our, on Downer Beach that are oblivious that this is going on. So please, if you're the first one on the site, you're just from the public, and you haven't gone through any of the other training, just remember this. Please take charge of the scene. Call us immediately on that number. We will go out as quickly as possible. Up here, it's Tony Amos. Down on North Padre Island, it's my number. That 1-866-TURTLE-5 is a number that will give you those telephone numbers specifically for the area that you're in. It will tell you the number for Tony. It will tell you the number for me if you're on North Padre. We'll get there as quickly as possible, but you just take care of the scene and tell those people, just wait a minute, and she'll be gone. Just hold up so that we don't run over the turtle or run over the eggs. So... Just a few pictures of the turtles just to show you how beautiful they are and show you some examples of nesting. Here's one. Again, they become partially covered with sand. Sometimes they uh, dig a shallow body pit before they dig the nest cavity beneath them. Here's an example of that, but that doesn't always occur. They're masters of concealing the nest with that moving of sand and tamping it down, which, again, makes our job very, very difficult. Here's another example of how well she blends in with the sand and the vegetation from a distance. Very, very hard to see her. I'll go back to the vehicle, get some equipment, and look around. Where's the nest? Where's the nesting turtle? There she is. And if you see one going back into the water, and she's got a lot of sand on her carapace. The carapace is the top shell. If you've, she's got a lot of sand on there, chances are she's nested. So you're going to want to go and uh, I'll describe in a minute how you're going to want to look for where that nest is in market. But this is a good indication that she's laid eggs. Now she's getting ready to head back in the water. There's one as she heads back in. There's a beautiful shot of what the tracks look like on the hard-packed wet sand, little divots in the sand from where the nails dig in. It's about two feet across. And also, here's an example. This is another one of our returnees. There's our, her living tag. She's one that I hatched. And there's her metal tag. And if you see, happen to see one that's got a metal tag, don't take off the tag. Write down what the tag number is. Take a picture of it. Um, those digital cameras now, boy, you can get right up and it'll be clear. Just save those pictures and get them to us. That'd be extremely helpful to us. And. Uh, when you call into that hotline number and you get a hold of somebody, they can give you specific instructions based on what the turtle is doing and where you're located. If the turtle's already gone back into the water and you just see tracks, there's our Mr. Tony at a site on Mustang Island. And uh, this is a beautiful example of tracks. It's, this is rarely how lucky you are, but good for him on this day. Very, very clear tracks, but just to show you as an example, You've got one set that's incoming and one that's outgoing. This disturbed area in the middle is where the nest is located. So if you're first on the scene, keep people away so they don't trample all over this area. This is like a crime scene. We need to preserve every bit of evidence because the wind is going gonna, gonna to tend to be conditions where the wind is blowing. You're 25, 30 miles per hour, destroying our evidence very quickly. So keep people off. Mark where you think the nest is located by putting some uh, material around it, but be careful not to destroy any of our evidence in the process of doing that. So walk to the side and keep people <coughs> off. And it's possible, there's the little, little ones coming out of a nest. It's possible that despite 
all our patrols and all of our public education efforts, a nest can be unbeknownst to us, and you may see a nest where hatchlings are emerging on the beach. It's happened before. And uh, if you happen to see that, we need you to mark where the nest is because we want to go back to that nest. We want to get any eggshells from it, any unhatched eggs. And there may be some hatchlings trapped at the bottom that we need to free. So mark where that nest is. Count how many hatchlings uh, go into the water. Get a photograph of them and protect them as they're going down the beach. They're very, very difficult to see. The beach drivers and the vehicles are not going to be able to see these little hatchlings. So make sure you protect them until they get into the water. Don't hold them back for us. Don't uh, you know, pick them up and move them around. And of course, you can't take them into your possession because they are protected by federal law. And let them go on into the water. And watch out for the gulls. Don't feed the gulls, please. These gulls in this area have become habituated to being fed. When I first started in 1980, releasing hatchlings on the beach was fine. The gulls wouldn't bother us. Over time, they've gotten so used to thinking when there's people, there's food. So we have, when we have the public come to hatchling releases, these gulls are waiting for their handout of food. So now I have to, and when they don't find human food, they'll come after the hatchlings. And they'll pick them up. They can't eat them. They'll drop them. They'll drop them in the grassland. They'll drop them on the parking lot. And it's very, very sad. So. I wish someday we could break that habit of people. So don't feed the gulls, please, because the gulls will try to nab these on the beach. So watch out for those. And I'll end there and say thank you very much that we're moving in the right direction to try to preserve Kemp's Ridley. And we appreciate everybody listening and learning about Kemp's Ridley and supporting our efforts. It's really a remarkable uh, story we've heard in a very uh, long-standing program that took a long time to uh, reward us with, uh, with their work. And it's a testament to, <laughs> testament to a scientist who's willing to be very patient. So uh, we'll have uh, any questions that you have for Dr. Shaver, and I'll repeat them so that we get them on the recording. Yes, sir. Have you observed uh, impacts of El Nino and La Nina? Have, have uh, impacts of El Nino and La Nina uh, been observed on the sea turtles? I, they have been on other sea turtle species, most definitely. But we haven't looked at it for ours, Kemp's Ridley at Padre National Seashore or in Texas. Uh, do you know in Mexico, have they done any studies with their data? I don't, I don't think that they've looked in, into that per se for, for this species. Um, in the Port Aransas area, How many types of sea turtles are there in this area? And if one sees one, what type of turtle is it likely to be? For sea turtles on the Port Aransas area, all, potentially all five sea turtle species that occur in the Gulf of Mexico could be found here stranded. Uh, we, meaning a stranded turtle is one found washed ashore. Typically, they're found washed ashore dead, but occasionally alive. Around the jetty area, maybe what you're uh, most interested in, because occasionally you can walk on the jetties and see turtles swimming around you. The species that's most frequent there is going to be the green sea turtle, which feeds on the algae on the jetty rocks. It's a herbivorous species. But also, though, we do get records of Kemp's Ridleys, of uh, loggerhead turtles, and of hawksbills being around the jetties there at Port Aransas. <laughs> Let's see, sir. Uh, clutches of eggs, uh, what, what's the spread and how, how many, what would be the average number? What is the uh, average number of eggs in a clutch and, and the spread of eggs in a clutch? It can vary greatly. It can vary from about 50 eggs all the way up to about 150 eggs. And the average now is about 97. The average number of eggs has been decreasing slightly over time, which we think is an indicator of a, um, a growing population, a more younger individuals coming into the population. Let's see, sir. What about that oil spill in the Deepwater Horizon? How are you, have you found uh, any killing or dirt habitat? Have you, have you avoided it at all? Do you know yeah. any, or will 
Yeah. Have there been any effects of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill on Kemp's Ridley Sea Turtles? Well, that's a, that's a complicated question, and study is going to take many years. And I'm involved in some studies, and unfortunately, we're not able to talk about them yet. Because there is a potential that there's going to be litigation between the U.S. government and BP to try to get restoration funds. So now we're in the process of studying, and we'll try to get information on that. It's, of course, a concern for sea turtles and many marine animals, uh, animals what the impacts are going to be. The turtles that you showed that have been tracked for along the coast, do the turtles go out into the big zone? That's a great question. Uh, Would you you're, repeat the question? For yes, me? yes. He was asking the tracking showed movements, uh, a movement pattern along the coast, and he was questioning whether the turtles actually go out in the deeper waters and cut across the Gulf of Mexico. And no, our tracking movements show hugging the coastline, being in about 50 meters or less water depth. And they're, as adults, primarily crab eaters, and that's where they're going to get the crabs. Out in the deep ocean waters, it'd be hard for them to, to make a living on those crab species. Get some Let's questions see. on the other side. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, okay. Oh, was, did I? Okay. <laughs> Let's see. I'm trying to not miss anybody, and I know I've had. Okay. Are there any Sir. natural predators that go after the eggs? You bet. That's their food potentially for a lot of things. Ghost crabs, fire ants, badgers, skunks, raccoons, coyotes will all take them. Yeah, it's a problem. And even if a nest is open, vultures will come and try to get them too. And then the little hatchlings, you have yeah, the gulls will try to get them, the ghost crabs will try to get them, and those other beach predators will also. So, sir? Uh, once the turtles are back in the ocean, uh, their odds of survival are pretty good. I mean, is there any yeah. predators in the ocean? Or? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough life for a sea turtle. Uh, <laughs> That's why the, they lay many clutches of eggs over their lifetime uh, to have enough that will replace mom and will replace dad. There's a lot of mortality in that egg and hatchling stage on the beach, but then also mortality at sea. The little hatchlings are bite size for fish and also for diving birds. Once they get to be about 12 inches long, then it's sharks and it's man that are the predators for them then. But yeah, those first few years of life are tough. They're very, very. Uh, once they get to be, you know, adult size, they they generally can avoid a shark unless they're um, weakened in some way. They're ill or say may have gotten caught by uh, a fisherman repeatedly and get weakened, and then they're vulnerable. So. Sir. Yeah. Let, yeah. Me, let me repeat that. Uh, the question is, uh, what are the key identifying marks for uh, distinguishing different species of sea turtles? Yes. Uh, as was pointed out, the leatherback is very different. It's very large, and it's got these long ridges on the carapace. So that is in a, a different grouping than the hard shell turtles. And the four that are in this area, the green turtle, the hawksbill, the loggerhead, and the Kemp's Ridley, you identify them by looking at the scute pattern, the pattern of those plates or scutes on the carapace, and then also the pattern of scales on the head. And there are taxonomic keys, you know, very simple with only four to choose from, that you, you look at those and can identify. The Kemp's really being the smallest, uh, it's got a pattern of five scutes on the side, five down the middle, and five on the side, which is the same pattern as the loggerhead but the Kemp's Ridley is wider than it is long, whereas the loggerhead is longer than wide. And then the hawks, bill, and green have a similar pattern of four on either side and five down the middle, but then you identify those two between looking at the scales on the head. So. Sir. Where 
they're going to uh, mail. Could you repeat the question? Yes, the question was from the, the tracking, I showed that the mails that had been tracked were mostly off the coast of Mexico, some were off of South Texas, whereas uh, the females that are, are nesting in Texas, we showed a, a wide variety of movements, including down into Texas and then Florida, Louisiana. Do these females go down into Mexico to mate and then come back to Texas? We don't have all the data on that. We haven't tracked males from our area, just, just a couple of them, two or three adult males from this area have been tracked, and they're actually, they range a, a bit on the coast as well. There's only been one female that I've had a transmitter where she was on her way back here to nest, but her transmitter quit before she actually got to the area. So I don't have the picture of her going down into Mexico. We don't know what happened to her. So we don't have a really complete picture. My guess is there's probably resident males here too. They're just much more difficult to study. If we did a similar study here, I'm guessing we'd see some that stay resident in this area, but we've got more work to do with them. They're harder to get. So, sir. Can you talk a little about the food source for the different kinds of turtles? Yes. The food source for the different types of turtles, the leatherback, the large one with the longitudinal <coughs> keels, uh, actually matures very rapidly. It's a more oceanic turtle, a deeper diver. It eats mostly jellyfish, which you think, wow, you know, but it eats a lot of them. So Somebody's got to. <laughs> yeah. And the green turtle, which is the one we found nearly 1,600 of them cold stunned in February on the Texas coast, an astonishing number, they feed mostly on algae and seagrasses. It's a herbivorous species. The hawksbill eats mostly sponges. And the loggerhead is a little more varied diet. It eats crabs and also some other invertebrates. Off the South Texas coast, it eats an invertebrate called a sea pen. And then the Kemp's Ridley is almost exclusively a crab eater at adulthood, but it has a more varied diet when it's young. It will eat also some mollusks and um, some other, sometimes a little bit of vegetation. Yes, ma'am. How much time between mating and laying of eggs? Good question. How much time between mating and laying of eggs? It's thought that it takes about, that mating occurs about 30 days before the first nest of the season, and that the females are able to store the sperm so they don't mate in between those nests within the nesting season. Sir. Uh, with the temperature determining the sex of the litter, is, uh, would you find that uh, all, one litter would be all females, one would be all males? That's, a, that's an excellent question. Boy, I tell you, this is as tough as my dissertation defense. <laughs> I tell you, that's a great question. The question was, is, uh, would all the hatchlings within one nest be male and all within another be female? Or would you see a mixture? And it depends on the temperature. You can get 100% of either, or you can get a nest that has a mixture, depending upon what that temperature is during the middle third of incubation. And what is the critical temperature, called the critical temperature, it's the temperature at which there's 50 males, 50% females. Uh, for Kemp's Ridley, it's about 30.2 degrees Celsius. And it's just like a degree or two, either way, can make a huge difference. It's a very small window to skew it either way. Yes, ma'am. During a nesting season, a Kemp's Ridley We'll, be to, uh, we'll nest between one and four times, an average of two and a half to three times for the Kemp's Ridley. For some other sea turtle species, they can nest up to eight times within a nesting season, but some only nest about every three or four years. The biology of the different species, each one is just a little different. How many eggs for Kemp's Ridley? On average, 97, but it can vary from 50 to 150, and you start to see a decrease, a slight decrease in the number of eggs towards the last clutch of the season. But some of the other species, it's going to vary how many eggs. Some more, some less. Yes, sir, in the red hat. Oh, Oops, sorry. The, uh, 
No, they store the sperm and the egg. They're not, they're not swimming around with four fully developed clutches within them. They'll lay a clutch of eggs and then the stored sperm will fertilize the egg and then it develops the albumin and then it becomes shelled and they start developing that ne next clutch. And for Kemp's Ridley, it's an average of 21 days between each time they nest within a nesting season. Okay, I'm going to get your question this time, sir. Are, are all the different species, do they all crawl onto the beach and nest the same way and stuff then? Yeah, all the sea turtles crawl onto the beach to nest. Uh, none of them, for a normal circumstance, will lay their eggs in the water. It's thought that maybe sometime if they can't find a proper area and they become stressed and it's or it's the last nest of the season, they'll dump their eggs in the water. But that's by far atypical. All the others come up on the beach and lay their eggs. There are some differences about what type of beach the different species like, uh, the beach slope, how much vegetation on the beach. Like the hawks bills like a narrow beach with mangroves. Uh, the Kemp's really likes a, uh, likes a wider beach, a, a sandy beach. There's some of the bigger species, like the green turtle and the leatherback, they need a deeper water approach. That's why most of their records are off Big Shell and Little Shell at Padral National Seashore that has a deeper water approach for those big turtles. Yes, sir. Forgive me, Dr. Shaver, your answers are very thorough. I can't help but ask. You graduated with your doctorate from A&M. Did you study under Dr. Dixon? No, I didn't. You did? I didn't. I studied under David Owens, Dr. David Owens. Okay. I did not. I, didn't, I was not fortunate enough to be there for Dr. Dixon. You would be very Oh, well, well, and I appreciate the possible linkage there, but he's a great, he's a great scientist. Thank you. Uh, you talked about the number of times that they lay eggs during one season, but uh, how often will the same uh, female, uh, male turtle, female turtle lay eggs every year or every other year? Or? Yeah. Uh, for, for Kemp's Ridley, they can nest every other year, ev excuse me, every year. We've had lots of records of them nesting every year, but sometimes it could be two, three, four years in between nests. The average for Kemp's Ridley is them nesting every other year. Yes, ma'am. repeat that question. Well, <laughs> the, the, que the, the question is, and I, and I don't want to leave the wrong impression here, there, there was, there's two parts to this I want to answer. The question was that with the exponential growth, um, somebody got the impression that I was saying, and I, I didn't mean to, to say that it will get to the point where we can't handle that number anymore. We're trying to adapt and grow our techniques so we will be able to continue to handle what is thrown at us. And how we're going to try to do that is through corrals. And we will continue to, to have those corrals. So right now, I don't see us being out of capacity. But the other part of this question was to get to the point to leave the nests in place, what is the thought about closing the beaches to driving? Well, many of you are winter Texans, and this is an idea that sits well with you. You're used to beaches that are closed to beach driving. However, if we had a room full of people that live here and live on North Padre Island, they would have a very different sentiment about it. They're used to driving on these beaches. So it's a traditional use that's gone on for a long time. And if it changes, it's going to take a lot of effort. So is that a good answer? Excellent. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I can, tell, I can tell you've worked in government service a long time. <laughs> I have. I have. I think yes, we should sir. take one more oh. question, and then uh, uh, we'll call it in. But aren't all the eggs that are in the corrals end up in delivery to the corrals? They are. So if you get 13,000 well, people coming up on the beach at once. Well, 
You know, they do it in Mexico. They handle 13,000. Uh, they don't come all in in one day at this point. I mean, if it gets to 13,000 in a day, then yeah, we've got to have some major readjustments of what we do. But when they get 13,000 in a year, they move everyone to a corral. They stay up all night to do it. And uh, it's just, a, it's the type of work where you have days where it's very quiet and then days where you may work for 24 hours straight to do the work you've got to do to take care of the nest. Why don't you uh, save any other questions for Dr. Shaver afterwards and uh, thank her once again. Thank you. Thank you.